In this video, we're going to talk about linear transformations. So let's first look at an example of a transformation. Transformation, we often call it t, and it is essentially a function whose input is a vector and whose output is a vector. We usually describe the length of the vector that we're inputting, so something uh, with two components, and the length of the vector that we're outputting, so we're outputting something with two components. In this specific example, the transformation rotates a vector by 90 degrees counterclockwise. So we're taking a vector in R2 into the transformation and it's outputting another vector in R2, uh, which is the rotation of the original vector. So for example, let's say we input the vector 2, 1. You can see it in the picture here. After the transformation is performed, that vector becomes negative 1, 2. You can see that in the second picture. So let's look at some notation. You can say t of 2, 1 is equal to negative 1, 2, or you can drop the brackets, which is a little bit more consistent with matrix notation. You can just write it like this, t, then the input vector is equal to the output vector. So either way um, is acceptable notation. And then just a little piece of terminology. We say that negative 1, 2 is the image of 2, 1 under t. So the image is just another way of saying output. Negative 1, 2 is the output when we input 2, 1 into the transformation t. Now let's look at a specific type of, of transformation that's really useful. It's called a matrix transformation. The notation we're going to use for that is t sub a. And what t sub a does, it multiplies a vector on the left by a. So to say t sub a of x is just exactly the same thing as saying a x. And so that's a very natural transformation that you can perform on a vector. Just take that vector, multiply it on the left by some matrix. So let's try an example. We're given a matrix a and we want to find t sub a applied to x, y, z. Well, really, this just involves recognizing what this notation means. This is a matrix transformation. And what that means is that the transformation is to take the matrix A and multiply it by our vector x, y, z. So we're really just going to perform this matrix multiplication here. So let's write out the matrix, multiply that by x, y, z, and we'll have our output vector. So our output is going to be 2x plus z in the first component, in the second component negative x plus y plus 3z. So this is an example of a transformation that takes a vector in R3 and outputs a vector in R2. I think in the notes I actually had a negative 3 in this position, so if you make that change, uh, it's just going to have a small impact on the signs here. So essentially here's a different example. So you got your matrix A, multiply your matrix A times your vector, and um, what we have is our output vector in R2. So part B, we're told that we have a matrix transformation applied to the vector xy, which gives us the following vector in R3, and the problem is to find the matrix A. All right, so what we want to imagine here is what this matrix transformation is doing. So it's multiplying some unknown matrix A by the vector xy, and it's producing this vector that we were given in the problem, so the 2x plus y, etc. Okay, now let's first think about the size of this matrix A that we would have to have sitting here. So first of all, it would have to have two columns so that when we do the dot product, I'll actually show the different entries in this matrix, so that when you do the dot product, um, that can dot with the vector x, y, and it's going to have to have three rows to produce the three different rows that we're seeing on the right side. Okay, now if we think about the first row of this matrix A, that's just going to encode the coefficients. So it's going to have to be 2, 1, so that when we do the dot product of 2, 1 with x, y, we produce this 2x plus y. So in a similar way, just by looking through the components um, on the right side, let's write them down, x minus y, 3x plus 3y, we're just going to be picking up um, the coefficients from these different components of this vector. So in the middle row we'll have 1 minus 1, 
and in the bottom row we'll have 3, 3. So that way we've figured out which matrix A multiplies with x, y to produce that vector on the right side. So because the question was saying find A, I think we could just somehow highlight this and say this is our matrix A that we're looking for. Now let's take a look at a definition. We're going to say that a transformation is linear if it has the following two nice algebra properties. So first property is that if you apply T to a sum of vectors, you get the sum of the images. So t of u plus v is the same thing as t of u plus t of v. Second nice algebra property is that if you apply a transformation to a multiple of a vector, you get the same thing as if you take the multiple of the image. And that would be true uh, for all vectors u and v of the correct dimension, and that would be true for all constants c. So again, a transformation is linear if it has these two nice algebra properties, and we will use these properties towards the end of this video. Now, our next fact helps us recognize quickly when a transformation is linear. So we need to know when a transformation is linear to know when we can use these two algebra properties. So the fact is that T is a linear transformation if and only if T is a matrix transformation. So if we can find a matrix A that performs the transformation, then we can automatically say that T is linear. We can't find a matrix, or if there is no matrix, we should say, there is no matrix that encodes that transformation, then um, at least one of those two nice algebra properties fails. And so let's do a couple of quick examples around um, investigating whether a transformation is linear or not. We're going to show that this transformation is linear. So the transformation t takes in the vector x, y, and it spits out the vector y, x. So the way we're going to show that the transformation is linear is we're going to find a matrix, and let's actually highlight it, we're going to find a matrix that actually performs that transformation. So if we were to put the, vec the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0 in here, you can multiply that with x, y, and confirm, yep, that does give us yx. Um, so just as an aside, how did we figure out this matrix? Well, it really just goes back to what we did in one of our previous examples. We were thinking about in the rows, just putting the coefficients that would encode the vector on the right side. So if we put the coefficients 0, 1, that would encode y, and if we put the coefficients 1, 0, that would encode x. So that's how we built that matrix. Okay, so we know that this transformation is linear because there does exist a matrix A that performs that transformation. Okay, now on the other hand, let's show that a transformation is not linear. Show that the transformation that inputs the vector x, y and outputs y, 1 plus x is not linear. Okay, to, so to show that a transformation is not linear, you need to show that no matrix M exists so that M times XY produces the correct vector. Um, so you could call your matrix A if you want. You could say no matrix A exists so that A times XY equals Y 1 plus X. Um, and so the idea is that this matrix should only contain numbers. So if we try this strategy of writing down the coefficients in the different rows of our matrix that will produce the vector y1 plus x, let's try it and see if we can make it happen. Well, first row is fine. We'd put 0, 1 in there, and that would produce y. Uh, but look what happens in the bottom row. We want to produce 1 plus x. So we could put a 1 here to multiply with the x. But when we get into the y position, or the bottom right position, we run into trouble. Because if you work through the algebra, you'd have to write something like 1 over y. Um, except that's not a matrix. That's really a family of matrices that depends on the value of y. And that's not acceptable. What we're looking for is a matrix that just contains constants. So there is no matrix A that we can put here 
to multiply with xy so that it always produces the vector y1 plus x. Um, so when you see that kind of situation, you just say what we said here, no matrix A exists, so that A times xy equals our output vector, and therefore um, our transformation is not linear because it's not a matrix transformation. So just as a reminder here, the matrix, whether you're calling it M or A, uh, it cannot have variables in it. It should just be one specific matrix that contains constants. So notice that the title of this section is Linear Transformations, and we now know that linear transformations are the same thing as matrix transformations. So in other words, we're just focusing on those transformations that can be described by a matrix. So this is where we're really going to get into some of the calculations in this section. Let's start with the definition. We're going to talk about the standard matrix for a transformation T, and that is the matrix that performs T. In notation, it's written like this. We just put square, back, square brackets around it, around T, to represent the standard matrix. So just as a notational point, T, when you write it like that, is a transformation. So it's a description of a function that turns a vector into another vector. For example, T could be something like rotate by 90 degrees. Whereas when you put square brackets around that, you're talking about the standard matrix or the matrix that actually does T. So let's talk about how to find the standard matrix because that's what we're going to be using for our calculations in this section. So to find your standard matrix, you're going to do a couple of side calculations. So to say this more concisely, you figure out how T acts on a unit vector along each of your coordinate axes and then you put those outputs into the columns of your standard matrix. So you might ask, hmm, why does this work? Well, it turns out that this process works because the transformation T is linear. So because our transformation T is linear, that means it's got those two nice algebra properties that we talked about a little bit earlier. And that means that if you know what T does to a unit vector along each of your coordinate axes, um, it's easy to calculate what t will do to any vector of the appropriate length. So we have a transformation t from r2 to r2 that reflects a vector in the y-axis. First thing we're going to do is find the standard matrix for t. Okay, so what we need to ask is what is t of 1, 0 and what is t of 0, 1? Once we figure these out, we'll put those into the columns of our standard matrix. Okay, so I'm going to draw a picture to illustrate this. So what our transformation does, it reflects a vector in the y-axis. So let's start with a vector that's going one unit along the x-axis. The reflection is happening this way, reflecting in the y-axis. So we're going to be producing this vector here, which is negative 1, 0. And then we'll do the same kind of thinking for our other vector. We're going to take a vector now that goes one unit along the y-axis. Think about what our transformation is. It reflects a vector in the y-axis. Um, so that vector is going to be unchanged after the reflection. It's still just going to be 0, 1. And so we've got our two outputs, and those are going to go into the columns to form our standard matrix. It is important that you put them in the correct order, um, because the first column here is representing what's happening in the x direction. So there's our negative 1, 0. We can circle that. We want to just conceptually understand that's coming from our first output vector um, and then this one coming from our second output vector. So there's our standard matrix and in part b what we're going to do is find t of xy. So now we'll get a little bit more insight as to how exactly the standard matrix works. So to find t of xy, what we're going to do is we're going to take our standard matrix for t, multiply it by our vector xy, and we've just figured out that our standard matrix is negative 1, 0, 0, 1. We're going to multiply that with the vector xy, and let's do our calculation. So just usual matrix multiplication at this point, we got negative xy. So we can now predict if we put input any vector in R2, we can easily figure out what the output's going to be. It's going to be negative x, y. 
So each transformation will have its own standard matrix, and in a similar way, you can calculate the, the output for any given input. Okay, while we've got this example on the screen, let's just understand in a little bit more detail how that standard matrix is working. So I'm gonna circle the columns here. Those were the images of unit vectors in our different directions. And normally uh, when we do matrix multiplication, we imagine the rows of the matrix sort of sliding over on top of the vector. But you could equally well imagine uh, flipping this vector, this XY, back over the matrix, see the X is going to be interacting with what's in the first column, and the Y is going to be interacting with whatever's in the second column. So because our transformation T is linear, if we know what T does to a unit vector in the X direction, and then we effectively multiply that vector by whatever the X coordinate is of our vector, that's going to tell us what T is doing to the vector x0. And then we can figure out what t is doing to the vector 0y by taking whatever our component here is, multiplying that with the image of a unit vector in the y direction. And then the matrix multiplication sums those up so that you get the overall output. So that's sort of just a quick intuitive way of, of describing why that process of setting up the standard matrix works. So now we have a transformation from R2 to R2 that reflects a vector in the line y equal x, and we're going to find the standard matrix. So here's our line y equal x. Similar to our previous example, we want to find t of 1, 0 and t of 0, 1, and those are going to go into the columns of the standard matrix. So if you start with the vector 1, 0, and you apply the transformation, which is to reflect in this line, y equal x, uh, our output is going to be 0, 1. And similarly, if you started with 0, 1, and reflect in the line y equal x, you're going to go back to 1, 0. So to get our standard matrix, we are just going to put these vectors into the columns it's important that we put the image of 1, 0 in the first column. So we need to put the 0, 1 here. And then the image of 0, 1, which is 1, 0, needs to go here. So it's always image of a unit vector in the x direction first, and then image of a unit vector in the y direction second. So that is our standard matrix. And then with that, we could figure out the image of any vector in R2. So now let's say we have a transformation from R2 to R2 that rotates a vector by angle theta that's in the usual positive direction, counterclockwise direction. And what we want to do is find the standard matrix for this transformation. So as usual, we need to think about what T is going to do to a unit vector along the X and Y axes. So let's start with the unit vector in the X direction. Okay, that's a vector one unit long. And imagine what happens after you've performed the rotation. So let's say that vector rotates over to here. So the length is still length 1, and this angle here is theta, whatever angle we've rotated by. So let's think about this right triangle that we've got in the picture. The base here is going to be cos theta, and the height is going to be sine theta. So if we write down the image of 1, 0, we can see the vector that we're producing. x component is going to be cos theta, y component is going to be sine theta. Okay, let's try the same thing with a unit vector in the y direction. So we've got a vector that's one unit long, and we're doing a rotation by angle theta. So after the rotation, our vector is still one unit long, and let's say that's angle theta there. So let's figure out, first of all, we'll think about uh, just the side lengths of this triangle, and then uh, we can think about the actual vector components. So vertically now, we're going to have cos theta, and the side length here is going to be sine theta. But when we actually translate that into a vector, we have to just be a little bit careful about the signs, because the way this triangle is positioned, the change in the vertical direction is positive, so it's positive cos theta for the vertical direction, 
um, but the the vector is actually running to the left, so the x component is going to be negative. It's negative sine theta. So we could say t of 0, 1 is, it would be negative sine theta cos theta. Okay, so those are the vectors that are going to go into the columns of our standard matrix, and here's our standard matrix coming up. So in the first column, it's the image of the unit vector in the x direction, cos theta, sine theta. And second column, the image of 0, 1, which is negative sine theta, cos theta. So this is a handy matrix to know. It's the standard matrix anytime we want to do a rotation. So let's try an example just to follow up with that. So let's rotate the vector 1, 1 by 30 degrees clockwise. All right, now the course pack has a tendency to try to trick people with this. Remember, clockwise is considered to be a negative rotation. So we're talking about an angle of negative 30 degrees. So let's first figure out our standard matrix. We could say standard matrix for this type of transformation. Well, because it's a rotation, we're just going to break out our rotation matrix. And we can evaluate that at the appropriate angle, which we said is going to be negative 30 degrees. Okay, now all these values are going to be over 2, so I'd be inclined to write a 1 half out in front of that matrix. Um, cos of negative 30 degrees, going to be root 3 over 2. Sine of negative 30 degrees is going to be negative 1 half, so we're getting a negative 1 here and a positive 1 there. So that's the matrix that actually performs that rotation. And then if we want t of 1, 1, then it's just a matter of taking this matrix and multiplying it by our vector. So let's just write the answer here. We can keep the 1 half out in front. Doing our usual matrix multiplication, we get root 3 plus 1 and minus 1 plus root 3. So now we have the transformation t from r2 to r2 that projects a vector on the line L, which is a line through the origin with a given direction vector. And our goal is to find the standard matrix for t. So let's just draw a picture here. We're in r2, and we've got some line L that passes through the origin. So the fact that L passes through the origin and has a known direction vector, gives us a complete description of L. So I'm just going to erase this direction vector here for clarity. Um, and then what we're going to be able to do is take any vector in R2, let's say you know this vector here, and we can imagine projecting that onto the line L. So if this is x here, this other blue vector would be t of x. So our transformation just projects vectors onto this line. So our goal is to find the standard matrix for t. So to do that, we have to do the usual calculation where we calculate t of 1, 0. And we're also going to need to calculate t of 0, 1. So let's start off with t of 1, 0. Well, what's happening? We are projecting the vector 1, 0 onto the line L. And to say that we're projecting on L is really the same thing as saying we're projecting onto that direction vector D. So that's why that vector D was given in the problem. Okay, so let's remember our projection formula. Projecting one vector onto another, you're taking the dot product of the two vectors divided by the length squared of the vector that you're projecting onto, and then that's multiplied by the vector that you're projecting onto. Now, the vector d here is not specifically known, but its components, we're just going to call them a, b for the sake of the calculation. Okay, so calculating the dot product, we would have a. The length squared of d would be a squared plus b squared, and then that gets multiplied by the vector d, which is a, b. So for reasons that will become clear in a minute, I'm going to keep the 1 over a squared plus b squared out in front but I'm actually going to multiply the a into the vector, so the vector becomes a squared ab. So let's try the same kind of reasoning uh, to calculate t of 0, 1, and then we'll have our standard matrix. 
So t of 0, 1, remember what t is doing is just projecting onto that vector d. And what we're projecting now is 0, 1. So we're going to be taking the dot product of these two vectors. So d dotted with 0, 1 divided by length squared of d in the direction d, or multiplied by d. So d, remember, is the vector that has uh, components a, b. So this is going to look like b over a squared plus b squared times the vector d, which is a, b. And we're going to make that look just a little bit nicer by multiplying the d, or sorry, multiplying this b that we see in the numerator. Let's multiply that b into our vector and actually call our vector a, b, b squared. Okay, so I'm going to write the answer right over here, just while we've got everything visible on the page. So this is our image of the unit vector in the x direction. This is our image of the unit vector in the y direction. And notice that they both have this 1 over a squared plus b squared. So we might as well write that out in front. And then uh, we're just pulling the components of the first vector, putting that into the first column. So a squared ab is the first column, and in the second column, ab b squared. So this is the matrix that's going to perform a projection on any line through the origin uh, where your direction vector is called AB. So now we want to talk about the idea of applying one transformation after another. So suppose we apply T1 and then T2 to a vector X. So T1 is being applied first. Couple of ways of writing this. You can write t2 of t1 of x, or you can write t2 composed with t1 of x. So personally, I prefer the first notation here. It's um, more intuitive, I think, functional notation. But if you like the composition of function notations, feel free to use the second version here. Um, what's really important is the order in which we're writing these down. See, if we want to indicate that t1 is being applied first, we have to be calculating t1 of x, and then once that's calculated, then we take t2 of that vector. So notationally, t1 has to be sitting closer to x than t2 is, just from a notational point of view, because t1 is acting first. So the way we actually calculate that, calculate the standard matrix for t1 and for t2, the standard matrix for T1 gets multiplied with X first, so that's like T1 acting on X, and then that spits out, so this whole thing then is a vector, and T2 acts on that vector. So let's just look at a quick example based on some of the ideas we've already seen. So let's say we have uh, two transformations described to us here. T is just described as a matrix transformation where T acts on X, Y, Z to give us 2X minus Y. And S is described in terms of what it does. It takes a vector in R2, returns a vector in R2, and what it's doing is rotating by 45 degrees. So what we want to do is find the standard matrix for S composed with T. Remember when we say S composed with T, that means T is going to act first and then S is going to act after. So what it's going to come down to is just finding the standard matrices for these two um, transformations, and then we'll multiply them together in the correct order. So standard matrix for T, we would just be picking out the coefficients. So if we look back at the question, just think about what matrix you would have to have sitting in this highlighted position to create the vector 2x minus y. Um, the coefficients would be 2, 0, 0 for the top row and 0, minus 1, 0 for the bottom row. So that's how we build the standard matrix for T. You can look back at our first example in this video if you want more details around that. Um, and then for S, well, we were told in the question that S is a rotation. So we would just pull out our rotation matrix and we would sub in the appropriate angle, which is 45 degrees and that would produce our standard matrix for S. Okay, so now that we've got 
both of those standard matrices. It's just a matter of figuring out in which order do we multiply them. When we say S composed with T, it means T is going to act on the vector first, on the input vector first. So we want our standard matrix for T sitting more to the right and standard matrix for S uh, sitting more to the left so that that will act after T has acted. So then it's just a matter of writing down our two standard matrices and multiplying them together in the usual way. And that way we have our answer for the standard matrix for S composed with T. And now let's look at another definition. Suppose we have a transformation T that goes from Rn to Rn. We're going to talk about the inverse of the transformation T. So the inverse of T is a transformation, which we're going to call T to the negative 1 or T inverse. It also goes from Rn to Rn. Um, and the main property that T inverse has is that when you apply T inverse to T of x, let's highlight this whole thing, apply T inverse to T of x, you produce x. And similarly, when you apply T to T inverse of x, you're producing x. So when I see these two equations, essentially what I'm thinking here is that T and T inverse undo each other. That's really what we're saying. So if you start with T of X and then you apply T inverse to that, that's going to give you back your original vector X. And same thing happens if you do it in the other way, if, in the other order. If we uh, calculate T inverse of X and then we apply T to that, that's going to give us the original vector X that we started with. So T and T inverse undo each other. So that's what it means uh, when we say the inverse of a transformation. The inverse is a transformation that's going to come along and undo the original transformation. Now notice that T inverse won't be defined for every single transformation. Some transformations are not invertible or don't have an inverse. So T inverse is only defined when the standard matrix for T is invertible. So that's a quick way of deciding whether a transformation is going to be invertible. If you want to know, hey, can I undo T? Then figure out the standard matrix for T and figure out if it has an inverse. If it does, then you can find the inverse for the transformation T. Um, if the standard matrix for T is not invertible, then the transformation T cannot be undone. It can't be inverted. So here's a nice fact that's going to encode that idea a little bit more concisely. If you want to find the standard matrix for T inverse, then just think about calculating the standard matrix for T and taking the inverse of that. So if you say this in words, you could say the standard matrix for T inverse is the inverse of the standard matrix for T. So here's a quick example. Let's say T goes from R2 to R2 and it's a rotation by negative 30 degrees. We want to find the standard matrix for T inverse. So there are two ways of thinking about it. They're both valid. And I'm going to show you both methods uh, so that we can just really tie the different concepts together. So if you want to find the standard matrix for an inverse transformation, one way to do it is to find the standard matrix for T and then just take the inverse of that. Another way to do it is to think intuitively about what is the inverse transformation. So in other words, just describe the inverse transformation to yourself. If T is a rotation by negative 30 degrees, then T inverse is a rotation by positive 30 degrees. And then maybe you can find the standard matrix for T inverse directly. So let's think through, for this particular problem, uh, which of the two methods is easier. So if T is a rotation by negative 30 degrees, then the standard matrix for T is our standard rotational matrix, cos theta minus sine theta, sine theta, cos theta, and then we're going to evaluate that at negative 30 degrees. So that's going to look like 1 half times the following matrix is going to be root 3, 1, negative 1, root 3. Okay, so that's the standard matrix for T. Now, if we want the standard matrix for T inverse, 
we need to take the inverse of this matrix. So we need to decide uh, whether that's going to be an easy thing to do or not. I would say, yeah, it's doable. Um, might take a little bit of work, but it can be done. Whereas method two, I would say, is quite a bit easier. Method two really only involves one step of algebra, the first step just being more of a conceptual step. Here, when you say T inverse, you're just thinking conceptually, hmm, what is the transformation that undoes T? It's going to have to be a rotation by 30 degrees. So we didn't have to do any algebra in that step. And then to find the standard matrix for that, we just pull out the usual standard matrix for rotation, sub in 30 degrees, and we're done. If you do want to try method one, uh, just a little word of advice. When you have something like a half sitting out in front of your matrix, remember that really means that every single entry in that matrix is over two. And we just want to be a little bit careful about that when we're calculating the determinant of this matrix. So it turns out that the determinant of this matrix is one. Um, that's something that tends to trip people up if they are solving the problem using method one. So just a little caution about that. So very last thing we need to do in this video is just talk in a little bit more detail about linear transformations. So I'm going to flash back to something that we said a bit earlier in the video. So let's look at this definition at the top of the screen here. We're saying a transformation T is linear if it has these two nice algebra properties. T of a sum of vectors is the same thing as the sum of the images, and T of a multiple of a vector is the multiple of the image. So knowing that a transformation is linear means that you're free to use these two properties in any calculation. So let's do one example where we actually use these properties to solve a problem. So let's say that we're told that T is a linear transformation. We're given three vectors, v1, v2, v3, and we're also given the images of those three vectors. So we know what T does to these three specific vectors. Um, turns out that T is taking vectors in R3 and returning vectors in R2. Um, and what we want to do is find what T does to a specific vector 736. So what I'm going to do is over on the side just write down the two properties of a linear transformation. We're told in the question that T is linear, therefore we know that T of a sum of vectors is going to be the same thing as T of u plus T of v. And we also know that if you apply T to a constant times a vector, you can just bring the constant out inside, outside and say that C times T of u. So we're going to figure out how these two properties come into play in our calculation. Well, the secret of solving the problem is to figure out how to write 736 as a linear combination of the vectors v1, v2, and v3. So let's start off by saying let 736 equal this linear combination of v1, v2, v3. We'll do a little bit of uh, matrix algebra and we'll just figure out what those coefficients are. So let's set this up in matrix form. I would say C1 times V1, well V1 is 1, 1, 0, plus C2 times V2, V2 being 1, 0, 1, plus C3 times V3, which is 0, 1, 1, is supposed to make the vector 7, 3, 6. So let's imagine doing some row operations here. I'm going to omit the details, but you could check them if you like. Uh, if we put this into our REF, we get a nice unique solution here. We actually get the identity matrix on the left side. And on the right side, what's coming out are the coefficients. So 2, 5, 1. So those are the values of C1, C2, C3. So at the end of the sort of first step of the problem, we figured out that the vector 736 is the same thing as 2 times V1 plus 5 times V2 plus V3. So at this point, we haven't done anything involving transformations. 
we've just uh, talked about a linear combination. So now for phase two of the problem, remember what we're trying to find is t of 7, 3, 6. So we can say, well, t of 7, 3, 6 is going to be the same thing as t of 2v1 plus 5v2 plus v3, since we've just figured out that 7, 3, 6, this guy here, can be just rewritten as that linear combination. Okay, so now this is where the magic happens. See, we know that t is linear. So we know that t of a sum is the sum of the images. Uh, the property was actually stated just in terms of two vectors, but you can extend that and say, you know, if you have t of, let's say, n vectors here, uh, that's the same thing as t of u1 plus t of u2 plus t of un. Uh, the reason that works is you're just using this property one essentially over and over and over again. So t of any sum of vectors is going to be always the sum of the images, no matter how many vectors you have in that sum. So this will be the same thing as t of 2v1 plus t of 5v2 plus t of v3. So the important thing to notice here is that this is true because t is linear. So this would apply to any matrix t that can be, or any transformation t that can be encoded with a matrix. Uh, we're allowed to use this property, but there are transformations out there that are not linear. There are many transformations that cannot be encoded by a matrix. And in those cases, you would not be free to use this property, at least not without further investigation. Okay, um, so that's sort of half of the algebra. The other property that t has if t is linear is that t of a multiple of a vector is equal to that multiple of the image. So essentially that's like saying the constants can be brought outside and we can say this is two times t of v1 plus five times t of v2 plus t of v3. Okay, now let's look back at the question and we'll realize that we're pretty much done. Remember, we were told in the question what t does to each of these vectors. So we know that t of v1 is the vector negative 5, 8. We know t of v2 is the vector 2, 2, etc. So we're just going to sub in the appropriate vectors and with a little bit of algebra we'll be done. So we are getting two times negative 5, 8 plus 5 times 2, 2 plus whatever t of v3 was, which we were told in the question was negative 1, 3. So here we have our answer coming up. We are just going to have a vector in R2, negative 1, 29. And it would probably be good to write down um, the second place where we used the property that t is linear. So this is one of the beauties of working with linear transformations is that um, you only need a little bit of information about how t is going to act. If you're in, let's say, R3, you just need three independent pieces of information about how t is going to act on three different vectors, and that's enough information to understand what t is going to do to any vector in that space. So that's why linear transformations are really useful. One of the reasons why they're really useful and really powerful. So that's our video on linear transformations. Thanks for watching.